Welcome to Christ the Lord Clearwater's weekly message. I'm Pastor John Beck, is here in our studio in Clearwater, Florida, where we share the good news of Jesus from the Gulf Coast. This is part two of our message series called Curious, as we ask questions about God, the church, and the Bible. Today we're going to be starting a conversation about the Bible, but I wonder if you're interested in that kind of thing. I mean, why spend time talking about the Bible? I'm going to start with an invitation for you to come with me into a Bible-centered conversation. But I won't just assume that you're automatically as interested in it as I am. We all have different interests, and sometimes at points in our lives, one thing is more important than the other. For example, if I'd give give you an invitation and say, Hey, do you want to join my cooking class? Together we'll read through Julia Child's masterpiece, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Some of you might say, yeah, I'm up for that. Others of you would say, not interested. I'll use my time somewhere else. But what if I'd say, do you want to join my fantasy sports league? Maybe your interests lie in that. So you might come on by and spend time with me on that topic. Or maybe some of you would share a hobby that I enjoy, which is tabletop gaming. Do you want to join my tabletop game night? Well, I'm not sure which of these topics might interest you, but how would you feel if I'd say, do you want to join my Bible fan club, my Bible book study, my, my Bible study group? Like, why the Bible? How interesting is a conversation about the Bible to you? I'm not sure what the Bible is to you in your life, but I've learned enough about our current culture to know that many see the Bible not as a very interesting timely topic. For some, it's kind of like a revered antique. Maybe this antique telephone back in the old days which served a purpose for a previous generation, but not so much anymore. It worked for its time, but now it's time for an update. Somebody might feel that way about the Bible. Why talk about the Bible if, if it's so old and outdated? Other people know that the Bible may have some benefit, but It's beneficial to people who are in trouble or need some sort of special spiritual support. So it's saved as if it's some sort of survival guide reserved for extreme circumstances. Such a person might say, well, I'll utilize it later when I have a need for something like that. There can be some pretty critical views of the Bible, people who are not fans at all, who would view it as some sort of historical propaganda poster trying to exert some sort of manipulation on people, exert oppressive control. And others just aren't actually interested in it at all, just saying the Bible is kind of nothing to me. In fact, it's a bit of a waste of time. Kind of like Flabberdoodle 123's YouTube video, three minutes of playing the recorder on the same note. It's there for anybody who wants it, but I'm not going to spend my time on that. One of the powerful things about the Bible is the claims that it makes. It makes claims of importance, and it says to the reader, I've got some profound things that are worth your time. Of course, the Bible contains the life story of Jesus, the preparation for him to come to the world and how he impacted the world. And while he was in the world, he said the words of a Bible quote in John chapter 6. He told his crowds that getting to know me is more important than eating. More important than eating. We know that on the list of needs for a typical human being, eating is right up there. And Jesus told the crowds of his day, who I am and what I'm telling you, the truth represented and recorded in the Bible is so vital, it's so necessary for your life that it's more important than eating. In fact, you've got to view me as food. You've got to view me and eat of me as if I were food itself. Now, that wasn't a popular idea to the crowds of his day. It was one of Jesus' least popular messages of all time. So a lot of his church people left and didn't come back. After the church service got over, Jesus turned to his committed close followers and he said, you aren't going to leave too, are you? And someone who is there, a kind of alpha personality named Simon Peter, responded, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now this Bible quote is so profound because if Peter was right. If Simon Peter was right that what Jesus had to convey to his audience of his day and the reader today is legitimately 
true, if Peter is right that Jesus holds words to eternal life, then anyone who is alive and working for a good life and a lasting good in their life can benefit from the Bible. Since you are alive right now and Peter uh, in that Bible quote said that Jesus was talking about eternal life, that means we're going to have some relevant content for you. I want to demonstrate to you just why the Bible is connected to you even if you might not feel very closely connected to it. Let's start out by acknowledging that all of us are involved in this thing called life, which Peter and Jesus were very interested in it. So if you're on this planet, planet Earth, and you're alive and living through it, you're, you're on your way through a type of path. And what you think about your path and how you explain your journey through this world is called your worldview, your way of looking at big picture and explaining everything. Now in Western civilization uh, especially, it's quite common for people to look at their path through the world as if it's a one-shot deal, to have a single-use worldview. That means that a human being's life is essentially disposable. It's good for one shot, and then after that lifetime is over, there's nothing of value left. It just becomes nothing. It ends. There's no more that can be done with it. And the moment when this happens is the moment when mortality shows up, death. Here's a video of illust an illustration of how the single-use worldview represents our journey through life. You can see that there was a point where that train went off the edge and it became dissembled. And that moment was the moment of its mortality. It was done being a train. A single-use worldview would view someone's obituary, their funeral service, when they're buried in the ground, when they take their last breath, as the moment when the train is done for. To put it in another way, here's an animation. As we go through life, a single-use worldview says, I'm being pushed along through time, I'm experiencing things, living, enjoying, and then I get to a point where it all goes black. Now since that blackness is inevitable, we have to figure out what are we going to do while that end of mortality uh, comes. Before it gets here, human beings have thought, well, what if we just try to make as good use of the time as we can? If we're disposable, let's get a lot out of our single use. This old idea called Epicureanism, or sometimes described as a hedonistic approach, basically says get as much fun out of this world as you can. Find what feels good, find what tastes good, uh, find what looks good, and fill your life with all the, the pleasurable moments that you can. Now, a second way of dealing with a disposable, wor a disposable worldview, single use, is to say, since you're going to lose everything, just don't even bother getting attached to it. It's all going to pass away. You can see this idea in the popular sci-fi stories of the Star Wars Jedi. Part of the Jedi Creed is not to get attached. Don't get married. Don't have deep relationship because if you could become attached to something and then it's torn away, that starts a process of pain which leads to anger and all sorts of bad things. It's not a good thing to experience loss and it brings out difficult emotions and sometimes anger in us. So the second view is the view of the Stoic who says, just don't get too attached. It's the wisdom of somebody considering getting a new pet. And they know that they are likely going to vastly outlive their new pet. So they have to decide if they're going to buy this new fuzzy little pet, if they are also going to be willing to put it down someday. If you buy it, you're going to have to bury it. 
And people might consider, ah, you know, I'd like a pet, but I just don't want to go through the heartbreaking moment of putting down my, my little pet that I love. A Stoic would say, it's wise. Don't get too attached. So have fun while you can is one approach to life. And don't get too attached is another. But in the end, both of them end up as absolutely nothing. In the end, it's irrelevant how you use your life if your life just becomes a, a, a piece of disposable garbage at the end. If nothing happens but darkness and decomposition, you just turn into dirt, turn into space dust, or turn into nothing at all. What you do while you're here in the end won't matter. You're a single-use, disposable life. Now, a far opposite of that is a different worldview which is much more popular in Eastern cultures and it's the idea that human life is a sort of recurring loop, an endless loop. Using that same train illustration, here's how a reincarnation existence is pictured. See, there's a moment of mortality there when death comes and the train ends. But in, in this video, something happens. Mortality, dying, isn't the end of the road for the train, but the train is reset. Part of the endless loop worldview is that existence right now, living existence, is you on a loop. And every time you go through this loop, you have a status or rank that's based on how well you live out your role in the loop. And when you die, that's when your value is determined. And if you made good use of your previous life loop, then your successive one will see you promoted. You'll receive a higher rank. It also means that if you don't do a good job with your life loop, you'll be demoted or given a poorer rank. One of the challenges of this worldview of an endless loop is it essentially says to a person who's in a lower caste in society, who may not be well off, may not be good looking, may not be healthy, may not have good eyesight, may have all sorts of problems, that based on the idea of merit in each loop cycle, the person who is having a hard time dealing with suffering or a lack of success in life is guilty of causing it. It blames the victim for their hard life by saying you must have deserved it. And it tells those who are good looking or successful or wealthy or in positions of power or influence even if they're born into it that they deserved it because they did something good. And so it robs in a sense the, the compassion that can unite humanity by by viewing someone in a lower social caste or a social lower level of uh, success or attractiveness or achievement and saying you're in a low place in life because you're a low value person. So these are two very contrasting worldviews. One says one use and then you're done, you're garbage. And the other says you're just stuck in an endless struggle and you better perform well or else you're going to be demoted. So perform, perform, perform. Climb, climb, climb. Interestingly, people who have a worldview aren't always consistent. We don't always live out life the way that our worldview would ask us to. Let's take the single-use disposable worldview. If someone who says there's nothing after death except what happens to a body when it dies, which is decomposition, it turns into something you have to dispose of. If we're disposable, we, we should just assume that there's an end to us. But there's this instinct, even in people who say there's nothing after death, to last. A desire to, to have some sort of presence in the world, even if we say when you're done, you're done. It's the idea that I don't really end if my name is on a library, do I? The pull of legacy to say, well, I may be dead, but I'm alive because my name's on the sign or my name's on the building or I had this charitable trust for, uh, for some, some group set up or I may be dead, but at least my, I made a mark on the world. I had some accomplishment. I accomplished a patent or at least my my grandchildren will remember my memory and carry me on in their minds. And as long as I'm even just a memory, I'll keep going. 
So anyone who's interested in a legacy and yet claims that you only get one life and once you're done, nothing matters anymore, it's just your end, shows that there's both a claim that nothing matters after mortality and also a desire to make sure that something matters and lasts after mortality. So these worldviews, trying to figure out what is this path we're on through life is a big reason to be interested in the Bible because much of what the Bible is centered around is the meaning of life and where we are going, what we're trying to get to. That's why when Jesus talked to his disciples, you're not going to leave after that sermon about the meaning of me in your life. Peter said, where would we go? We've discovered that you have the words of life eternal. Now Peter's phrase shows us a third path through life, a third way of looking at your journey on this planet right now. That neither is your life garbage that's disposable someday, nor are you stuck in an endless uh, performance cycle, always trying to get a better job or move up on the ladder. But there's a third option. third option is getting life right. And by life here, in the biblical perspective, this worldview is unending or lasting enjoyment of God and His blessings. God being a higher power and blessings being how our experience is better when we align with the design that comes to us from our higher power. So you might view it as a line of experience that goes on. It doesn't circle around and reset and reset and reset, but it also doesn't dead end. And it's a line of continual experience, eternal or everlasting, that doesn't lose its enjoyment. It doesn't become boring. It doesn't become solitary confinement. It doesn't become stuck in some sort of purgatory or limbo state. It's life that is good to be enjoying, that doesn't crash and burn, that doesn't break on you, but you just have a good day and another good day. And having two good days in a row doesn't diminish the fact that you, doesn't diminish the goodness of it. It's hard for human beings to think about existence that could be a lasting enjoyment. But that's the way the biblical worldview describes life. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that get us to this eternal life. Lasting enjoyment of God and His blessings. In this world, there are only a few sources of knowledge that exist that offer information on life's biggest questions. There's not that many original philosophers and there's not that many uh, sacred texts that claim to reach into the deep questions. There's only one source of knowledge in human information sources that exists that demonstrated in good eyewitness history a solution to life's biggest problems. So I hope you'll come back with me next uh, episode in Curious Part 3 as we explore a little bit about how we got the Bible, how we know its writings are trustworthy and preserved, and answer some of the difficult questions that make the Bible hard for some people to appreciate. Thanks for accepting my invitation to join me, not in the game club or the cooking club or the fantasy sports club, but in this conversation about the value of the Bible in our lives. See you next week.